Scoring a 700 on the GMAT is a goal for many test takers, but not many know that you can actually get a number of questions wrong and still get a 700 GMAT. So that's what we're going to talk about in this video here. For those of you who don't know me, I scored a 710 on the GMAT and a 730. I gained 280 points. After graduating from INSEAD last year, I now work at Bain in the United States and I'm parting my knowledge onto you guys to help you do uh, similar things in your life. So section one of this video, uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of how the actual GMAT score is calculated. So most of you already know there's four sections, analytical writing assignment, integrated reasoning, quantitative re reasoning, and then verbal reasoning, of course. But of those four, only the quant and verbal uh, sections count towards your overall score, which is from 200 to 800. And most aspire to get a 700 GMAT because it puts them within plus or minus 30 points of pretty much any school that they can apply to, any business school. So how many questions are there in quant and verbal sections in the GMAT? Quant has 31 questions, verbal has 36. But if you don't know this, actually not all those cash, uh, questions count towards your overall score. So with quant, only 28 of the 31 questions count towards your overall score. Or verbal, only 30 actually count towards your overall score. The gap, so the three questions in quant, the six in verbal, those represent experimental questions. Now, for those of you who don't already know this, question difficulty is a very important concept in the, in the GMAT. Basically, harder questions count, toward, count for more points. Easier questions, getting them wrong will penalize you heftily. <laughs> and it's imperative that you get most of those easy questions right. Uh, if not all. Now, why I'm mentioning this is because experimental questions are experimental in as far as makers of the test don't know what difficulty they are. So they throw them in with each time a test is taken out by someone so they can gauge that difficulty. Then plan to put that in later on based on that difficulty and thus accurately gauge someone on how they answer that question. So for the purpose of this video, I'm basically just going to be talking about the counter question. So how many counter questions you can get wrong. Key thing you need to know is that the GMAT is a computer adaptive test. Uh, the score is based on your quant verbal, as I mentioned. And, you know, it basically means that the same number of questions correct uh, can give two different GMAT scores based on the difficulty of the questions, as well as order in which they're, they're answered, sections of which they're answered, and the number of incorrect questions, right? And that's what we're going to explore now. Just to touch on that a bit more, so just to clarify, the same quant and verbal section scores can be associated with different GMAT scores. For example, a quant uh, score of 47 and a verbal score of 36 can correspond to either a 670 uh, or a 680 actually. The number of correct answers required to achieve a particular score can also vary. For example, a verbal score of 37 can be achieved with 18 to 24 incorrect. So when determining how many questions can be missed in the GMAT, it's really important to just remember these, All right? All right, so the crux of the video, how many questions you can actually get wrong? Well, this requires a bit of analysis and I've already done it for you. So I'm gonna jump onto the screen now. Okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you some insider knowledge on how to actually analyze and understand what number of questions you can actually get wrong. So if you don't know this, I've mentioned there are 28 total questions that are counted for quant out towards your overall GMAT score. There are 30 counted questions for verbal. Now, you won't know where these are in the actual tests, right? So you should treat basically all your questions as if they are counted. Most important thing to know though, is that because there are 28 counted questions in quant, there are seven in each quartile. The GMAT uh, test is basically split up, each section quant and verbal are split up into quartiles, first, second, third, and fourth. And that's how the questions of quant are split. With verbal, the counted questions are split a bit different, right? And look, you can actually calculate how they're split based on the mathematical combinations here, right? Because there's only certain ways whole number of questions can be allocated across four different uh, sections of the test, right? Now, verbal, there are eight, eight uh, counter questions in the first and last quartile, and seven in the second and third. Let's talk through the allocation of the questions and what I'm now 
going to show you is my enhanced score report. This is a snapshot of my enhanced score report or ESR. Your ESR can be ordered each time you do a test online or in person. And basically what this is, is a breakdown of where you went wrong. I don't recommend ordering an ESR if you're getting in the 500s. It's almost a waste of money, okay? It's about $30 US. Now, what I have here is the most important uh, part for this analysis. It's basically the questions I got wrong and right across the quartiles of either quant or verbal. And as you can see here, we'll start from the top with, with quant. And I got 71% across the first three sections and then 43% in the last. And I also re recorded the actual average difficulty of those questions here. Now this results in 10, I mean, doing some simple math here, you know, these are the questions I got right. So therefore these are the questions I got wrong of the counted questions. So 71% you know, is 29% um, wrong, therefore 29% multiplied by seven is two, roughly two. So 10 questions incorrect in quant, applying the same analysis of verbal, it's six questions incorrect. Therefore I had 16 questions incorrect in total. So how many questions can you actually get wrong on the GMAT and still get that 700? Well, as I mentioned before, there are many ways you can get a 700 and this chart from Target Test Prep's website highlights many all, all the combinations actually of questions you can get wrong. You can go from extremities, so high verbal scores and you know high or high quant scores, or you can have balanced scenarios here, which you're you know doing okay. It's really important to highlight that actually schools tend to like good quant scores, but a balanced score overall. And also it's important to mention that you, you shouldn't really neglect IR or AWA because if you do, then you may need to redo the tests and you know, get those scores up. Some schools have minimum IR scores. INSEAD is one, for example, they have a minimum of six. Other schools, you know, they, they might look at your a low, very low AWA score and wonder what the hell happened, okay? And the last thing you want to do after getting a very high score in your GMAT is going in just to retake it for IR or AWA. So what I'm going to show you now is some scenarios. I considered three scenarios here. There's balanced, quant, high verbal, and then, ah, sorry, balanced score overall, high verbal, and then high quant. Coming back to the analysis, how many questions in the GMAT can you get wrong in the balanced scenario? Well, let's have a look at this. A balanced score of 48, the balanced 700 GMAT is a 48 in quant and a 38 in verbal. Now, what we can see here is that if we take this random person's ESR, which is Google, Googled it, you can do the same. You can put those questions out the same way I did and apply some math again. And simple math here, 71% right, therefore 29% wrong, 88% um, right in the first, first quadrants, which is ironic because he took pretty much the same pathway that I did. And as you can see here, nine questions were answered incorrectly for quant, eight questions were answered incorrectly for verbal. And he still got, this person still got a 700, even though they got 17 incorrect in total. Okay, so now if you're a gun at quant, let's just say you can get a Q50 and or 49 to 51 is a yeah, very high quant. So what would be, you know, an okay verbal? Verbal score of 34 would be considered okay. Let's apply the same analysis. Now, as you can see here, this person got 14 incorrect. So our range is right now from 14 to 60. And in fact, oh sorry, 70. In fact, you can see in the three scenarios we've looked at so far, the 710 scenario, which is mine, there was 16 incorrect. 700 scenario which is you know, equally balanced is 17 incorrect so only one more incorrect for an extra 10 points uh of loss sorry now the strong quant scenario this person got 14 incorrect so he got fewer incorrect right which is a bit funny here because it shows that in my opinion it would be better to get an overall balanced score you can get more incorrect and still get the same 700 gmat but from an effort and study perspective, people, I think, invest too much in one area, right? And they tend to end up in these scenarios where they're, they're getting, uh, they have to get fewer incorrect 
to get that that score. So I think it's it's better to balance out, right? If not, try and focus on verbal more because uh, it's harder to to increase a score in verbal than it is in quant. Let's con- let's look at the strong verbal score, okay? So in this scenario, this person got a V40, as you can see from this ESI randomly plucked, and they got a Q46. Now. Basically, I've allocated the number of questions that got incorrect. So they got 100% right in the first quartile for quant, and then you know, the rest they did pretty average. And these difficulties, just ignore them. I just carried forward the same template. So how did that transpire for this first? Well, he got he or she got 17 incorrect, and they still got a 700 GMAT. So now our range is what? 17, we had 14 before, and then we had 17 again and then 16 in my case so 14 to 17 incorrect you can get 700 to 710 on your gmat and again this person they went higher in verbal so you, you may not need to do that the overall takeaway here is that you can get at least from these scenarios 14 to 17 incorrect and still get between 700 to 710 on your gmat so the key question you probably want to know is where does this play in and can you really you know, game your GMAT based on this? The answer is no, because of two things. Firstly, the experimental questions that I mentioned. Secondly, question difficulty. You cannot control for those variables. So coming back to the experimental questions, you don't know where they're gonna be. You have to treat each question as if they were experiment. So you can see that running the scenarios, certain outcomes or certain scenarios result in more or less incorrect. So the balanced uh, scenario actually allowed you to get more incorrect and still walk away with a very high score. But obviously it's harder to balance out and be equally good in both. So what I recommend is, you know, if you do have issues with one particular area, make sure you're doubling down that area to bring it up. Um, apply the same study techniques that I, I you know, give to everyone and you should be fine with that area. But just put more time towards it. Verbal is notoriously harder to increase, okay? And that's because it requires, you know, a rewrite of basically the way you interpret and understand the logic text. <laughs> now, the question difficulty variable that you can't control for, you know, not all questions are equally weighted. Missing easy questions, as I as I already mentioned, really does kill your score. You have to be blowing away those easy questions. Uh, getting hard questions right does count for more, and getting them wrong actually doesn't impact your score as much. So the expectation to get a high GMAT is that is that you can basically get all easy and the majority of medium questions right. So you should be training and studying like that. You'll be getting all those easy medium questions right in your studies. And if you're not, then you have to be doing that and you can't move on until you do. All right. The other third thing that you can take away from this is that all of the analysis that we all, we all just went through, as you can see here, the one, two, majority of these ESRs, look, look here on the right, majority of them did really well in their first section okay and in some cases you know this person got a q50 by getting 100 percent and then he he went to crap afterwards most likely because the questions got more difficult but what it what the key takeaway is here that is that you, you basically need to kill the first section right i did it in mine you can see that uh the verbal score i got was I probably have had difficult questions there, 88% right, then 100%. And then in quant, you can see that I didn't do as well in quant, and that's sort of backed up by my performance in the first section. So I would be willing to wager that if I had an 80 to 100% correct in that first section, but the same or even reduced percentages incorrect in the later quartiles of the test, quant, I probably would have walked away with a Q48. I mean, you can see it with this person's data here. He or she had, uh, you know, the same percentage wrong uh, right in the first. Then he had 100% in the second, and then he went right downhill. And he had one point higher. So, just factor these variables in. It does influence the way the score is calculated. Key thing you need to know is you can still get, you know, 
number of questions wrong, 14 to 17 is the range we toy with in this video. Make sure you are training to get all your easy and medium questions right. Thank you and hope you enjoy the next one.